either one of those. That's right. But now let me let me ask Mr. Carson, how do you see all of this affecting the Democratic Party? Um, it, it, it affects us tremendously. Um, so as a recent, uh, what I've been trying to do is raise awareness around the issue. Uh, we've had voter registration drives as well as doing voter education at those drives. Uh, basically, the Election Commission, their argument is the low voter turnout uh, is the reason they want to close some of these precincts. Um, I went to a meeting at the Election Commission uh, maybe two weeks ago, and I spoke on behalf of the party, and I let them know that uh, basically uh, there is a sense of apathy amongst the Democratic voters, and the, vote, the, the turnout is low, and we're working on that now. But as Representative Hardaway just mentioned, uh, there are several people in these districts and by these precincts, they're accustomed to going to these polls. Uh, people have been voting at these precincts 10, 15, 20 years. They stay right down the street. It's convenient for them. Now, um, if you switch up the voting precincts, especially with the huge election we have coming up next year, 2014, um, the, apathy, the apathy will increase. Um, all we need is an excuse. Long lines, uh, too far to go, anything like that would discourage our base of voting. Ultimately, it would cost us elections. So what I proposed is if they want to try out a pilot and close some precincts, let's not do it next year. There's too much at stake. You know, we have, we're going to have over 160 positions on the ballot next year. Let's try this 2015. Let's, you know, go back to the drawing board and make sure everyone comes to a consensus and agrees on certain precincts that we can close. Because at the end of the day, historically, some of those precincts, that the voter turnout is relatively really low, and it may not increase. Um, but closing 39, uh, this close to 2014, I don't see uh, it benefiting uh, the Democratic Party at all. Well, let me jump in. And gentlemen, please respond to this. I'm going to get to the midpoint between what you just said mm -hmm. and what Representative Hardaway said. Voter apathy. Um, on one side and then on the other side you're talking about responsibility the responsibility of freedom and what the average voter what the average person is saying is that I vote for somebody to take an office and when they get the office they do absolutely nothing with it or they forget about me uh, one of the laments of pastors such as myself is that we see um, elected officials around elected time all of a sudden they want to become saved or they want to start preaching in the pulpit I got to say it the way I say it <laughs> you know they they want to they want to upstage Jesus and and talk about why y'all need to elect me and I think we've gotten to the place we have various things that are happening the perfect storm first of all the political machinery that used to exist doesn't look the same. Like you had the Ford machine at one point, doesn't look the same. You had people with Harrington who actually worked with Ford and then started to do his own thing, doesn't look the same. So you have all this jockeying, you have the Cohen machine, you know, you got all of these different pieces and no piece is predominant. So you have a shift taking place. You have younger persons now coming into their own and so you have all these pieces moving, but at the same time, it seems like the politician, and I'm within a striking distance of a politician that may hit me when I say this, but the, the voters are like, y'all are not taking care of us, so why should we even bother to go to the polls to vote for you? You know, this is supposed to be a democratic county, and, we're, and I'm purposely being the cynic, so just understand. Uh, this is a democratic county, but when I vote for y'all, you forget all about us. So how do we fix that is my question. Dr. Hutchison, since I'm the closest. <laughs> <and> <laughs> right, let me take the first swing at the question. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And it's quite simple uh, that if you uh, think of your responsibilities you think of the people, for the people, by the people. Mm -hmm. That's government. I'm not government uh, when we elect our uh, next representative to replace uh, uh, Speaker Pro Tem uh, D. Berry, Ramesh uh, Akberry. She's not government. Government is all of us. Mm -hmm. This is not a spectator sport. You have to get involved in a representative democracy 
for it to work. The mistake we make, and the reason we make it is because our political IQ, our civic IQ, was intentionally dumbed down by our leadership and the opposition. Okay. Neither wanted to have an informed electorate because that increased the the, uh, the possibility mm -hmm. that you would look at what you and, should be getting. And, from and let me jump in for a little bit because this is basically what he's saying. He's saying that we've dumbed down the populace to the point where they don't understand the job description of the elected official. It, and so it becomes a popularity contest. That's it. That's it. You don't know what my job is, so you don't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what to expect, you can't hold me accountable. Mm -hmm. You've heard me say often that we have two seasons. We have the election season and then we have governing. I refer to the election season as a season of hope. Mm -hmm. That's when all the elected officials and wannabe elected officials will come to you and tell you what a wonderful thing it will be and what a wonderful life you will live mm -hmm. if you will only vote and send them to office. Mm -hmm. But after you've elected that man or woman, your responsibilities still go on. Mm -hmm. You have to hold them accountable to do their job during the governing part. That's called the season of help. Mm -hmm. So we move from the season of hope which is about elections and campaigns into the season of health, which is about governing, mm -hmm. delivering on your campaign promises. That's where we disappear. We elect people to office and uh, turn out and, and get all inspired. It's like we're in church at times. <laughs> <laughs> but then, after they are elected, someone else moves in and reaps all the benefits mm -hmm. of our hard work. Mm -hmm. Until we get to the point to where we know what the job responsibilities are for the different elected officials and we start to hold them accountable, and you can't do that unless you keep up with what's going on, keep up with current events, keep up with news from more than one uh, uh, source. Call your elected official and express your, uh, your position on different issues. Mm -hmm. uh, show up. Show up in uh, Nashville. Uh, get on the bus and go to D.C. Uh, be heard at committee hearings. Call your elected officials into your community. Tell them you want to see them at a community forum. Tell them you want them to see them uh, at a house uh, 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 coke party mm -hmm. or, or hot dog and chips party. Tell them to come explain their actions to you. Mm -hmm. When they promise you a certain agenda during that season of hope, during the campaign season, you should have a timeline and a checklist of what they accomplish and when they get it done. Mm -hmm. And if they don't do the job, you need to do just like the private sector. Hire somebody else to get the job done. So it's our fault. It's our fault meaning citizens. I'm with you. Go right ahead, sir. And I I, also, I agree with every, everything Representative Hollywood said. And, and, and that's a micro view. A, a macro view. I go down to the, to the micro, micro view. I think ultimately what we have lost is a real sense of direction and community and things that keep us as a cohesive unit. Unlike the other side, and we're talking about Republican, Democrat, black, white, business community versus grassroots, they have an agenda. One of the problems that, that I see in the modern day black politics is that in the real agenda, it's very hard to hold people accountable if we don't have an agenda on the front end. Here's how the ecosystem works with Republican politics. They have think tanks, the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, the Brookings Institution. They've got multiple different think tanks that they draw policy from. From that policy goes into the strategy folks who develop strategies based around the talking points, which go to the, the, the spin meisters, your Frank Luntz and others, and Carl Rose. From that, those talking points are given to all of the different divisions of labor within the Republican whole ecosystem that they have through the media. And from that comes their agenda and their policy. What is, what's happened in black politics is the modern day black politician has turned into his own strategist think tank, his own. And so the division of labor is not there in a way that efficiently pushes forward. So in other words, if that particular politician gets in trouble or is attacked by the media, then the whole agenda goes down because we don't have an army. I like to say in campaigns that this is not checkers. This stuff is chess. 
And in many respects, we've been playing checkers in a chessboard game. And so we've got to have a whole different way of looking at it and have a political ecosystem that says, here is the agenda drawn from the people from the grassroots. If, if my mama goes against the agenda, I love you, mama, but I'm still going to love you, but I'm going to vote you out, mama. We haven't gotten to that point yet, so there's a certain level of political immaturity involved in our politics now that the political machines handled years ago. I don't think we can have a people's convention, for instance, like we had before, because the rationale was to elect the first black mayor. Mm -hmm. We got that now. So what we got to do is be able to come up with a set of priorities that are directed from the grassroots that that are forced upon, and I, I'm using strong language, that are forced upon the people who want to be our leaders. And lastly, we got to look at what people did before they actually became elected officials. One of the problems I see in politics is, and I'm just being frank here, my own personal opinion is those that are not willing to serve, quite frankly, are unfit to lead. And too many people want, too many of our folks want to lead, and have yet to show that they are able to follow or to serve. And so what we've done is we created little kings and little fiefdoms, fiefdoms of political strength without political strength. Lastly, in a war, the first thing that's taken down is your communications apparatus. We don't have a way to properly communicate our message. Most of our black radio stations have been bought out by conglomerates. The newspaper is owned by you know who. And so what I call this iron triangle of media attacking politicians that don't go along with the, the, the conventional thinking, the district attorney's office or the, the, the what I call the law enforcement apparatus, and big business funding things that go against us. There are a lot of things going on right now. We just don't have a clue because we're playing ch checkers in a chessboard game. So until we have a real political ecosystem that's drawn from the grassroots, we're going to continue to have this problem because we can be attacked from any level. If he's going out trying to do the right thing, if the paper don't want to go along with it. They'll just put some nasty about him in the paper. Ten percent of our people believe it. That's all they need to knock off. Mm -hmm. Plus to lose a countywide election. The the media is against us on terms of of getting the vote out because let's just be frank and I'm going to shut up after this. If elections were transparent, fair, if they were reported properly, and if the skull double that's been going on with the election committee commission was actually properly reported, we win every election in town, countywide and local. Mm -hmm. well, what would that mean? Just be frank. That would mean you'd have black people at every level of politics. And there are people in this town who just can't have that. Well, now, let me push the envelope right where you left it. And first of all, I know you're not going to be quiet after that. But I like how you say that. That sounds good. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'm, like a politician. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. But, um, you know, a, a merry heart do good like a medicine. So we can have fun while we're being serious. But now... I want to push the envelope right there because we need to open this conversation up and we're going to go over time because we have a, another guest. We're going to give her as much time as necessary. So we're, we're going to go over time. But I want to push this right where you put brought us. We need to talk about the election commission, um, its composition, the fact that it's Republican driven. And then we need to talk about just open up some of this agenda that we're seeing. Um, there are various things that are getting ready to come to us. And some of this conversation may not be politically correct. You know, in some of what I'm about to say, I may lose some friends, but I've lost friends before. But now, we got to ask ourselves, what is the agenda? We got to ask ourselves, even as we look at things like the pre-K initiative and some other things that are coming down the pike, what is some of that about? We got to ask ourselves how early voting is set up. You know, let's open this up and kind of critique some of what we see and kind of take the blinders up. Because the good thing about being on this show, and I'm not saying it because I'm the host, but I'm saying it because you have a venue in which you can speak your mind. This is a venue that's owned by us. So nobody's going to come and wave and say you can't say that. This is where we can be ourselves and speak our story our way. So y'all talk to me about some of the things that we're seeing because I'm going to give you an example of why I raised this. Now, it's an open secret. I ran for school board. When I went down to run for the school board, I asked them to give me a map of the district that I was going to be running in. That's a simple request. Exactly. They didn't have a map. Now, fortunately, 
I had saved what the commercial appeal had in terms of the map. So I kind of knew where the district was. I kind of drove through the district, had a feel of it, right? So then maybe about, I'd say a month later, they said, well, we can give you now a big blow up map. You know, brother strategist, you like those big maps, right? Because you want to really see, see what you're doing. I go down and give them the $10 for the map. It's about $10, something like that. Come to find out that this map and the date is on the map. The map was composed and shaped before you even had to apply to be a part of the election. I think you, you could start to uh, register to be a part of the election in, um, in uh, February and the map was dated January. So what does that tell you? Confusion going on, right? It's absolutely, how can you run for a seat and they not have a map to tell you what you're running for? Well, let, let me speak to that. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to be respectful. <laughs> but I have dealt with the Election Commission for decades. Mm -hmm. And these past few years has been some of the most ridiculous years of, when it comes to the service that comes out of that that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And there's no excuse for it. I can tell you that until, and we often hear that there's no Republican way to govern, there's not a Democratic way to govern, and that may be true in a real technical sense, mm -hmm. but when you look at how your values and how your, uh, your, your method of, of operations impact how you handle your business, mm -hmm. there is a Republican way and there is a Democratic way. Mm -hmm. I can tell you as a legislator, when I'm voting on a bill that's going to do redistricting, it spells out in that bill exactly what uh, is going to be contained as far as census blocks in these different uh, uh, areas, mm -hmm. districts. And with that being uh, information that's compiled by the party in power, and in, in the past uh, a few years it's been the Republican Party, they have the correct information mm -hmm. and they share the correct information. The information we tend to get from the public resources available could be anything, but they have the correct information that they share amongst each other. That's why you didn't hear any Republican candidates out there talking about they couldn't get the right map, they couldn't get the right list of, uh, of voters in their priest. You didn't hear that. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they have the information that comes straight from Nashville, even before we vote on the bill. Mm. Before we vote on the bill, they know what it is because the Republican Party drives government. On the state level, the Republican Party drives government. On the county level, the Republican Party drives government. On the city level. When you see uh, individuals who uh, hold themselves out to be nice guys, nice women, they, you like them because of their personality and they, they tend to show up and be ceremonial when you ask them to, that's all well and fine. But at the end of the day, if you're a Democrat, you're going to tend to support President Obama and his agenda. Mm -hmm. You're going to tend to support most of the state uh, parties' democratic agenda. Mm -hmm. You'll tend to support democratic values mm -hmm. and how you get there. If you're mm -hmm. a Republican, you're going to tend to support what John Boehner is doing up there in Congress. Mm -hmm. You'll tend to support uh, the Republican Party on a national level because the way they run their politics is the same way they run their government. And I challenge you to find anything different. I've got some good friends who are Republicans, and I'll tell you that one of them happens to be the mayor, Mayor mm -hmm. Luttrell. Mm -hmm. He's a nice guy. I like him. Mm -hmm. But I also understand that he answers to the Republican Party. The Republican Party ain't nothing nice about it. So true. when I'm looking at who I want to put in charge of my life, 
on the county level, I don't want the Republican Party running. Mm-hmm. So nice guy or not, I've got to go find a Democrat that shares my values, supports the people I support, and won't work against President Obama and his agenda. Mm-hmm. The same thing uh, when I look at the uh, the presidential or the congressional or the uh, senatorial or the county commissioners. I want someone that will work to make democratic values part of their governing process. Because right now you got Haslam, and it may be for political theater, saying that he perhaps should have accepted the monies for the Affordable Care Act. You know, probably political theater, but you understand what I'm saying. I understand more (laughs) than what you're saying. I've had umpteen discussions about the Affordable Care Act expanding uh, Medicaid, being able to set up a state-operated marketplace exchange Mm -hmm. system, and the administration, the uh, the governor's administration, has refused to move on it. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the Republican Party. That's right has said, we don't want to do anything that will show President Barack Obama having a successful rollout of Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. So then maybe Fincher needs to give all that money back, but that's a Fincher, whole other <laughs> Well, I can tell you this. Because the governor uh, has been intimidated by the Republicans in the legislature who are given their running and, and uh, marching orders by the Republican Party, We've got 300 plus thousand, 330,000 or so uh, Tennesseans who will go without health care. 180 plus thousand, 190,000 of them uh, or so will be women. Uh, and then you, you uh, will find that you, you've got another 118,000, 120, somewhere in that neighborhood who will be African Americans who will go without health care. Without health care, your life is at risk. We've got people who will die, will die, because they won't have adequate access, they won't have timely access to adequate health care. And this is all just politics. If we accept the money, three years, the federal government is going to put all the money up. And then they'll start to uh, uh, to phase it out to somewhere around 90 some percent. And we can't put the value of life before we uh, start putting uh, things in place. We, I got an invitation for a uh, fancy uh, walking trail up there in the Centennial Park, which a walking trail is nothing but a fancy sidewalk mm-hmm. you know, when it's in the city. Uh, we've got uh, big to do's. Uh, ceremonies that the state is sponsoring and paying for all this yet you tell me you can't accept free money free money from the federal government that can help us to look after the health of our citizens and if we don't take that money it doesn't go back to the taxpayers it's going to some other state Mm -hmm. to pay to look after those citizens Arkansas is accepting it. So you've got Tennessee tax dollars that are going to the federal government and are going to be spit, or, uh, spent rather, over in Arkansas to look after our Kansans. All right. Well, brother man who said he wasn't going to talk again, I see you chomping at the bit. So come on. I, I was just going to defer to Brian to talk about go, go right party ahead. issues go right related ahead. to what the, the difference between the Democrats and Republicans. Well, yeah, well, the difference in uh, with the Democrats and Republicans basically is uh, what Representative Hardaway said. A lot of their focus is on capitalism and money. And the Democratic Party, we're the big tent party. Um, and they have it confused. They think that we're all about giving people a handout. Well, actually, we're about giving people a leg up. Uh, it's a lot of people in the Democratic Party, we're, uh, they come from impoverished communities. And this is not all their fault. If your parents, grandparents, um, they had a, a lack of education, uh, they were working two or three jobs, uh, you came up, you were in certain neighborhoods where it was a crime infested, uh, bad health care information, the violence was at all time high. Um, those, are un- that, those, are in- those situations are unfortunate. So we need to give those people a leg up. And so that's where the, un- the affordable health care Health Act comes into play and other initiatives that Democrats want to adopt. 
uh, the Republicans, they don't see it that way. I agree. And I think as far as early voting goes, uh, when because I want to segue back into this for, for a minute. It seems like we're in a climate now. Where we talk about how Republicans do things as to where they're trying to condense early voting to people going to the downtown location. And now, I, you know, personally, and, and I want y'all to jump in on this, and then after we dialogue on this, we're going to have our next guest come. Personally, I think that's also a form of voter suppression. And I want to open this up to you, you all, because you all are the experts, you know. I have an educated opinion, but you all are the experts. Talk to us about what that looks like. I, and, and Brother Harris, I'm going to pick on you. You step in first. You know, because... First of all, where are you going to park if you decide to go downtown to vote at the election commission? You can't park in one of their spaces because you'll get a big ticket or your car will get towed. So where are you going to park to go vote? That's the first thing. And then do you want to drive that far just to vote in early voting? So just kind of talk, to, uh, talk about the issue. Well, it is voter suppression. I mean, if you... Restrict the number of days, and the Republicans are doing this all over the country. I think there is a place in North Carolina where they consolidated some precincts. They put, I think, 11,000 people in a precinct that had 35 parking spaces. So that was intentional. So 11,000 people can't park in 30 parking spaces even if they show up. So, for instance, for argument's sake, if I add extra days downtown, I can almost guarantee that the majority of the people that are going to go out and vote aren't going to vote. And I read a story in the paper where where the proponents of the sales tax issue, uh, the increase of the sales tax for quote unquote pre-K, uh, they're looking forward to low turnout because that's the way they're going to win their thing. So that's what makes me think or believe that this is some kind of method. But not just that, if we close precincts, if we add more days downtown, we've got a Republican legislature, they could theoretically cut the number of early voting days. They've got a multitude of tools at their, at their disposal to change that number. Let me just give a quick, quick example. State law gives you about five minutes to vote. There's five minutes to vote. There's 60 minutes in an hour. So on each machine on a given day, you can only vote 12 people per hour on one machine. Mm -hmm. So if you've got one machine on election day and they're open 12 hours, there's only 144 people, basic math that can vote on that machine all day long. So if you've got, say, two machines in there, 288 people only can vote. So if by restricting the number of machines, I, I, can, I can assure that there will be lines mm -hmm. and that people will leave on their own volition. Uh, by, by decreasing the number of machines and sites and parking spaces, mm. I can assure them. So these things are done by design. Again, we have been playing political checkers for years in a real chessboard game when it comes to redistricting. One of the things they've done, they use a lot of census data. Well, there are parts of the, the parts of Memphis where there are so-called people there, but they aren't registered voters. You know, some of them are children. If that's not overlaid with the number of registered voters, you've got a rigged district. And that's, if you look at the new, you pointed out the problem with your map. When you look at that, you will know right away. But if I put it out the last minute, by the time you find out the game is rigged, it's too late. Lastly, you've got a media here that's not really friendly to the issues that we're talking about right now. Yeah, they give me toast to some of the things we're talking about. But for the most part, they haven't done their job to do real hardcore investigative reporting. I read a story about the South Lamar the other day. They did investigative reporting. I read about Ernest Withers. They did went back 40 years. But we had an audit at the county where voter registration files were deleted during the county audit. They haven't done an investigative story on that. So there's really not, among the people who really are in the know, there's really no real reason to clean up the election process. G.A. was talking a minute ago about it and Brown was talking about it. Your question is, there's not an incentive. Because a fair system that allows everybody to vote, that gives everybody an opportunity to vote, means we win everything. They don't demographically have the numbers. They know that. Well, let's, let, let, let's kind of press some of what you said in a different way. And I mentioned it on this show um, probably about a week ago. They put in the paper um, or that they think 
I'll just put it that way, that allegedly, Janice Fully Love was at the uh, city council and she had, you know, some rocket fuel in her. You know what I mean, <laughs> drinking, right? And my issue is that whether you like Janice or dislike Janice, why are we focusing on that? That's probably something that's being run up the pole for us to look at it where we have some more serious issues afoot. Because now, you've been in this thing a while, you've been in this thing a while, you've been in it, and your family's been in it. You know that there's a bunch of folk that come to some of these meetings lit up. And that never been an issue before. Now all of a sudden, we're going to hop on one person. We've had mayors that have been lit up. Yeah. And stop me when I'm lying, y'all. But they weren't trying to get a million dollars for a black project. South, well, that's true. South but see, now, even with that, now that we, it, it, and I purposely not dealt with that issue on this show, not because I couldn't deal with it, but that that situation has so many layers to it, oh, yeah. and it's become so politicized that to deal with it would be messy. Because let's tell the truth and shame the devil. In Memphis, we have two black families that keep intermarrying each other. We're connected in so many different ways and on so many different layers that in some issues you see we're not politically correct here in some issues if you start pulling off those layers you start seeing some stuff you don't want to see and that's one of those issues that are to me and this is me talking that unfortunately because of the fact that we don't have a lot of legislation putting money in our community that it's become heavily politicized. And now it's become an issue of whether you like the mayor or you dislike the mayor. So now it's so politicized you almost can't touch it. Whereas the issue should never be the mayor when it comes to bolstering the community. The issue needs to be the community. Forget the mayor. I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, but Whitehaven needs money, South Memphis needs money, Frazier needs money, Raleigh needs money, Orange Mound needs money, Hickory Hill needs money, and needs investment. And every, I'm going to say this, I'm not going to let y'all say it, every city council person ought to be finding ways to put money in those communities so that we could better what we're talking about amongst our people. And that's part of the legislative process that was laid out so well by State Representative Hardaway a few minutes earlier. And that's what we need to be hopping on, but we hop on this minor stuff. Somebody, and, and I'm not saying she did, but somebody getting their drink on before they come to the meeting. Well, I hate to tell you, if you had a breathalyzer test at all of these meetings, you're going to catch some more people. Right. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. You're going to catch some more people. So, all right, but now, we and, and go ahead, go ahead. You're, you're correct on that, and I'm not politically correct uh, uh, myself, so I just have to do it like you say, uh, uh, bring the truth. But we are engaged in foolishness the majority of the time. Uh, we're more entertained than we are educated when it comes to government. And while we're busy, uh, absorbing the entertainment aspects of the goings on. Somebody else is over here taking care of business. Exactly. They're educated on the facts of what the actual content is of legislation, where the appropriations or where the money is flowing, while we're over here talking about personalities. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget, I was blessed to have uh, lunch with Diane Nash uh, when uh, she was uh, received one of the awards from the uh, awesome freedom individual the, uh, the National Civil Rights Museum and the one thing she told me to remember is you can't build a movement and expect it to uh, be sustainable on a personality okay? mm -hmm. everyone has got to buy into what the purpose is you've got to have a plan that's laid out something that will survive the person if Dr. King had not had the type of uh, people around him who understood where we were trying to get to, how we were going to accomplish uh, moving towards the dream, what it was all about. If it wasn't for the people around him, the dream would have died with the man. 
What we don't understand yet is when we let the media get us focused on a personality and hung up on a personality, what he or she is doing or not doing, as opposed to what the content is of the agenda exactly. that's being promoted by that person, we lose. We get so much fun out of uh, watching what in, in uh, actuality is a political reality show. Mm -hmm. That's most of what we see when we look at news reporting on our uh, local elected officials, state elected officials, congressional elected officials. I, I still have to tell you when I heard uh, Steve Cohen say that uh, he felt like he was uh, relating to black folks because he had baby mama drama and drove a, 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 an old car, uh, I was insulted. But he Me was too. playing right into the sensationalism that goes with this mass media out there. They want to sell uh, commercials, they want to sell time, and they're going to entertain us because that's all we ask for. And until we start demanding that we get real information that will allow us to evaluate what our elected officials are doing for us, especially those that sit in legislative positions. Mm -hmm. I hear a lot of the nonsense being directed towards the mayor, being uh, directed towards uh, 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 those who are in administrative positions. But at the end of the day, the local legislative body for the city is the city council. That's right. They decide on what the laws are going to be that the mayor has to carry out. That's right. They decide on what the budget is going to be. They vote on the budget. They determine how much is going to be spent and where. Same thing for the county commission. Exactly. That's a local legislative body for the county. They decide on what the budget is going to look like, no matter what the mayor presents. They decide where it's going to be spent, how it's going to be spent, what part of the city. So if you don't have local legislative representatives that fight for their district and have enough statesmanship to be able to bring those appropriations, get those dollars back to the people, because you send the dollars down there. Mm -hmm. It's not like magic. They don't, uh, mm -hmm. you don't get them off a tree. These are property tax dollars. These are sales tax dollars. These are fees that you pay for certain services. The, this is your money that's mm -hmm. being spent. If you don't push your local legislative representative, your city council person, your county commissioner, your school board commissioner to spend your dollars wisely the way you want them spent to bring some benefit back to your district, it's your fault. That's true. Well, look, we got to stop here only because we have a guest that's been waiting in the wings. We've gone over our time. We could talk probably for about two or three hours. But when we come back, we're going to add somebody to the mix. I'm not going to tell you who. You're going to have to stay and tune in. So don't go anywhere. Stay right here. This is Black Thought. I'm your host, Dr. Hutchinson.